we had a little rain last night. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Now that rain was great for our plants. They're sitting in a planter box that I built about seven years ago, and it's holding up great. The reason for that is that it's made out of swamp cypress. Now we get the swamp cypress from George Goodwin down in Florida, and he's bringing them up from river bottoms. When the timbers were originally cut and sent down the river to the sawmill, a lot of them were lost and they just sank to the bottom a hundred years ago. He brings them up, cuts them into timber, and dries them. And we buy the rough material like this. Now with a little bit of work, this is what it looks like cleaned up. Look at the figure in this wood. And it's very rot resistant, which makes it ideal for building outdoor projects. Now we're going to take some of this material and build some boxes and benches. It's called a deck system. But before we do that, let's check out George's operation. Today we're in Micanopy, Florida, south of Gainesville in north central Florida. We're at a sawmill where they take reclaimed timbers and logs and turn them into flooring, molding, and millwork. Now the owner, George Goodwin, we met a few years back up in Georgia pulling logs out of a river. Now today he's going to give us a tour of his mill. Now Norm, this is a log. Boy, I'll say. Look at this. How old do you think this is? This tree was about 1,200 years old when it was cut down. Uh, it was cut down by axe and had lain in the river bottom for about 100 years, I would guess, before we found it. Wow, so you've hauled it out of the river. Now, what explains all these holes on this That's side? from marine borers, mm -hmm. but they're very superficial. So they don't go in very far. Not, don't go in very, but an inch or two. Now, you're telling me that you can turn a tough-looking log like this into beautiful slabs of wood? Absolutely. How do you do it? Let's go see. Well, George, that chainsaw mill does a great job on these big logs. That chainsaw is about the only way we can saw these big mm -hmm. logs, Norm. Uh, we've got a smaller band mill that will small, saw smaller logs, but this is the only way we can handle these big ones. Boy, look at this piece of wood. That That's is... going to make a beautiful <laughs> tabletop or countertop for somebody. I, I could see that. But, you know, this wood is soaking wet. What do you do with it next? Well, the next step, we'll go look. Here, Norm, we're stacking out some heart pine lumber, putting one-inch boards between the layers mm -hmm. so that it'll air dry, the air circulation can get to it. Now, how long ha does it sit out in the yard, air drying? Heart pine, two to three months. Uh, cypress, about four to six months. Boy, that's pretty slick, George. You're rolling in quite a pile of lumber into this building. Yeah, we're putting about 10,000 board feet into this, this kiln. It's a uh, dehumidification dry kiln. So you're going to seal up this opening with a door and turn it on. So how long will it sit in the kiln? Uh, seven to ten days. Mm -hmm. We'll dry it down to about six to eight percent. And then it's ready to turn into flooring or molding right. or sell it just as it e is. Exactly. After we threw the machining and milling and sanding some of this lumber, this is what it looks like, Norm. This is a real beautiful slab of heart cypress that's going to be a headboard for a friend of mine's bed. Wow, that's nice. That's a nice piece. This is some 10-inch TNG that we ran yesterday that will be in, go into some flooring. Wow, can you imagine the finish on this? Turns it to that nice honey color. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous. We also manufacture 100% quarter saw and heart pine flooring. These pieces are going to end up in that floor in Key West that we were talking about. That's right. It's our This Old House project. A absolutely. Oh, and look at this. This is some fairly rare material. This is some curly grain heart pine. Uh, we find it in limited quantities every year. Makes for an interesting floor, that's absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. I see you have some pieces of furniture here. Yeah, these are a couple of pieces from a limited line of heart pine and cherry furniture that we manufacture here in our shop. 
It was built the way furniture was built 150, 200 years ago. Oh, hand cut dovetails. Square pegs, round holes. Beautiful. Our customers also uh, call on us to make crown moldings. That's a piece of six inch mm -hmm. uh, heart cypress crown molding. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of six inch heart pine crown molding. And this is the beginnings of a very nice door for a dentist friend of ours for his, for his new home. Very impressive. If you need kitchen cabinets, here's some raised panel kitchen cabinet doors. Wow, look at that pine. And <laughs> feel the weight. <laughs> very dense, very dense. Well, it doesn't look like you'll have much trouble filling an order for us. I'd like to get some cypress to build a project back at the shop. We'd love to do it. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. I'm starting today by working on the corners of the boxes. In order to get the thickness that I wanted, I had to glue some material together. I've taken eight-quarter stock and three-quarter stock to make up the thickness. Now, it's very important that the joint where the two pieces are glued is nice and flat. So the first thing I do is take the rough stock and plane two surfaces so I get that nice even joint. The best way to do that is at the joiner. But before we go back to using power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Just putting a witness mark on the jointed surfaces to make sure that's where I put the glue. The next step is going to make it a little more efficient in the clamping operation. I like to clamp several sets together at the same time. But you can see when I put these together that it's an uneven joint. And that means I'll have uneven pressure on the glue joint itself. To help with that, I'm just going to run the other rough surface through my surface plane. Now for the glue up. I'm going to use a polyurethane type glue. And what I like to do is just run a bit down the middle of the piece. And you don't need a lot of this glue. You want to spread it out so that it's a, just a thin coat. I just use a piece of scrap wood to spread it out. Just sort of like a squeegee. Just move it around on the piece until you get a nice, even coat. Now, on the mating surface, it's not necessary to put glue. All you have to do is put on some water. That's what the manufacturer recommends, because this glue will actually dry in the presence of water. Now, if you get this stuff on your hands, it's going to be with you for a week. So an investment in cheap rubber gloves is well worth it. Now, when I put the pieces together, I like to just wiggle them around a bit to make sure that we're getting good glue connection. And when I clamp these up, you'll see that it's going to start to foam almost immediately. It's a characteristic of this glue. And the foam will get very hard when it's fully cured. There, you can see how it's starting to foam already. But we'll just set it aside to dry. I glued up a couple blanks last night, and once they're removed from the clamps, I just scrape away any excess foam from the glue itself, and I can get two corner posts for the boxes out of each blank. I want to true this edge up first, and I do that at the joiner. Okay, now with that edge nice and square to the surface, I place it against my rip fence and make one of the posts. Four posts on each box are going to be connected by some rails, which will also hold a panel. I'm using a mortise and tenon joint for that connection. I make the mortises in the post with my dedicated mortiser. I've set it up with a half inch chisel. I've set the fence so that the mortise is the right distance from the edge. And I have this hold down clamp so it won't come up as I remove the chisel. The next step is to form tenons on the ends of the rails to fit into those mortises. So I've set up the table saw with the rip fence the right distance away to give me a one inch long tenon. I've raised the saw blade to 9 sixteenths of an inch, and I just use my miter gauge to push the pieces through, making two cuts on each end. With the fence still in the same position, but the saw blade lowered to 3 eighths of an inch, I've made a shoulder cut along the narrow dimension of the rail. The next operation is to remove the material to the saw cut that I just made. I'm using my band saw with a straight edge clamp, 
and I make that notch just on one edge of each rail. For the last few minutes, I've been making the cheek cuts on the tenons. Now, I use this tenoning jig, which rides in the miter slot of the saw, and its benefit is that I can clamp these narrow pieces securely in place while I run them through. What I'm doing now is taking each rail, and along the edge that I haven't touched yet, I'm running a half inch wide, 3 8 inch deep groove. And that's going to be used to receive this half inch MDO board, which is going to make the panels for the box. Here I'm making a groove in one of the posts for the box. That will also hold the panel. I couldn't do it at the table saw with the dado head because the groove would have come all the way through and would have shown. Instead, I'm using a half inch router bit set up in my router table. And what I do is align with this split in my fence, the location of the mortise, drop it down over the bit so it's right in that mortise hole, push it through until I reach the other mortise, and then I have a groove between. For the panels of our boxes, we're turning to our old friend MDO plywood. Now, it's a great material for outdoor projects because it resists the weather and it takes paint great. I can't tell you how many emails we get with people asking, what is MDO and where do I get it? MDO stands for medium density overlay. It's the facing that goes over the plywood substrate. If you can't get it at your home center, call your local sign maker because they use it all the time. They might be able to tell you where to get it. It's a material that you should be using. Now we're going to paint the boxes. So I've moved the pieces into the shop before I do any assembly because I want to make sure I prime these grooves. The panels are not going to be glued in place. They're just going to set in there loose, which means water can get into the groove. If I put a coat of primer on it now, that's going to protect the wood, make the project last longer. I also want to take the time to spray the edges of the MDO board. Well, now I'm ready for some of the assembly. And the glue that I'm using here is just a weatherproof carpenter's glue. It's the same glue that I used on the planter you saw earlier, and it's held up really well. The real advantage to it is that it's a lot easier to clean up than the polyurethane glue. So I'm just going to put a thin coat in the mortise and on the tenons, and we'll clamp it all up. Okay, now just slide in the panel and put another post on. Now that I have these two sub-assemblies clamped up, all I have to do is put in four more rails, two more pieces of plywood, and we'll have a box. All right. Clean up a little bit of the glue that squeezed out. And I think I'll stick around long enough tonight to build the other two boxes. Good morning. Last night, I did stay around the shop long enough to build the remaining two boxes. This morning I came in, removed all the clamps, and now I'm taking some time to smooth out all the intersections of the joints. I'm using my six inch random orbit sander. I started out with 80 grit to cut it down quickly and make it even. Then I switched to 120 grit to smooth it up and get it ready for paint. Now this step is not purely decorative. It's functional also. I want to make this top of the post and these corners people friendly so that they don't get caught on sharp edges. I'm also going to chamfer the bottom of each post so that when you slide it around on the patio or the deck, it'll minimize any chipping of the legs. Now to do this, I'm simply using my chamfering bit with the ball bearing on it, which just rides on the edge. Here I'm just taking some time to break the edges at all these 90 degree corners. That way the paint will stick better. 
We'll vac these off, take them into the paint shop, and give them a nice coat of paint. I want to get a nice, smooth, glossy finish on these planters, and so I'm going to spray the paint on. I'm starting with a primer coat, and the idea is to just spray it on nice and even. Thin coats are better than one heavy coat. And after this dries, we'll put on the finished color. While we let the primer dry, let's start working on the benches that are going to connect the boxes. I'm going to make a bench that's about 48 inches long, which is plenty of room for two people, and 15 and a quarter inches wide, which will fit between the posts of the box. We're using some more of our cypress, and this time we're going to leave it natural. We're going to let this weather. I have a framework for the bench made up of two and a half inch wide by inch and seven eighths thick cypress. What I'm going to do at the corners is half lap the joint. I could miter it, but miters always open up. I could use a mortise and tenon joint, but I think the half lap will give me the most strength. Later, I'm going to have a field of slats, which will be set into a groove of the short pieces, and I've spaced them so the water will drain through. First thing I want to do is make those half laps. Before I commit to making the cuts and the actual pieces for the bench in this very expensive cypress, I've taken a few minutes to make a sample of the half lap joint. I want it to be perfect. Now what I've done is set up the height of the saw so that it's removing exactly half the thickness of the material, and I've set the fence to make the right shoulder so that the piece will be nice and flush on the corner. Now the key to getting a nice tight joint like this is to have the stock perfectly flat. If it's twisted, you're going to have imperfections in the joint. Okay, now once again, before I commit to my final pieces of stock, I've made a sample. And on the short pieces of the bench, I'm going to place a groove on the bottom that's going to sit right on top of the rails of our boxes. And that'll register it square to the box. To make the dado, I've actually set up the dado head cutter the right distance from the fence. I'm going to make one pass from each edge, and that'll center the dado at the correct width. Then I'll move the fence over and make a final cleaning pass in the center. To make the final pass that's going to clean out the center, just slide the fence over, sighting down through the remaining piece to the dado, and just run it through. For the last few minutes, I've been making a sample and setting up my tools for the joint between the short ends of the bench and the slats. I have a half inch dado, and later I'm going to rabbit the slats so the two pieces fit together like this, nice and flush to the top. I'm simply using my half inch straight cutting bit. On the long side of the bench, I'm making two small mortises and they're going to receive some cross pieces. And what that does for me is gives more support for these narrow slats. I don't want them to bend down when people sit down. I make the mortises over at the dedicated mortiser. Now that the primer is dry, I can start applying the final color. I'm using this hunter green. It's a good color for a planter box. It'll probably take a couple coats to make the rabbits on the end of the slat so it'll fit into that groove that I've made, I've installed a stackfishal strip on my rip fence. I slid it over the blade so that a half inch cut will be made, and I've raised the blade so that it leaves a half inch of material. To get rid of the sharp edges on the seat slats, I've now moved my chamfering bit into the router table. Two passes takes care of each piece. Okay, now we're ready for a little assembly of our benches. I've put some glue in the mortises for those intermediate support pieces for the slats, a little bit of glue on the tenon, and we'll just slip those in place. There's no mechanical fasteners for these pieces, just glue. For the half laps, a nice even coat of glue on both sides of the joint. Slide the pieces together. 
And I'll secure it with a couple screws for the slats. I'm once again installing a coat of glue on the end of it. And I'm just going to slide it into that groove, leaving a quarter inch space between the slats. No mechanical fasteners here. Now the tricky part. <laughs> Trying to get all these pieces to come together. Okay, now I can flip it over and secure the half laps on the other end. Now one screw into each slat through the center supports. Just a little cleanup of the glue that's squeezed out of the joints. A quick pass with the sander will smooth everything up. Quick pass with the chamfering bit around the edges will remove all the sharp points. This little plywood jig will allow me to drill corresponding holes both in the top of the box and the underside of the seat for these doll pins which will add strength to the connection. I've just made some notches in the corner of some one by four pressure treated stock and those notches allow me to fit around the post of the boxes. I'm just going to put the pieces in, leaving about a quarter of an inch space in between to allow for some drainage for the soil that's going to be in here. The center one is just a little bit narrower, and I'll just secure them in place with some brads. Now let's see how these fit together. Line them up over the box. Taps down. Perfect. Let's check out the height. That's good. Plenty of room for two people on each bench. Now that's it for the woodworking. I wonder who I can get to help me with the plants. Well, I got lucky. I have a neighbor who's a gardener and he agreed to plant the boxes. In this one, he put a dwarf spruce with some ivy. Over here, a dwarf pine with a slightly different ivy. And over here, a repeat of the first box. Now we set the system inboard on the deck. We could have put it out on the perimeter, and there it would act as a bit of a barrier. It's a good system. Once you learn how to build the boxes and the benches, you can build whatever you need for your situation. And you gotta admit, it's attractive. Norm's back tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 or at 6.30 in the morning.